understanding that weird book of Revelation. This is part 15. And uh, I'm going to read the text and then do just a teeny bit of uh, catch up as to where we are in the book. Looking at the beast and the false prophet. Revelation 13, we started last week looking at 10 verses. Now we're going to pick it up at verse 11. So John is uh, describing these visions, these unbelievable and incredibly hard to explain images shown to him as the Lord speaks to him on the island of Patmos. He says, then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. We talked about the dragon in Revelation 12. It's one of the few characters just so specifically identified in the book of Revelation where it's, he's called Satan, the devil. Uh, it's just made very specific. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. Verse 12, it exercises all authority of the first beast in its presence. We looked at that last week and I'll recap a wee bit and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. We talked about that a bit last week. I'll talk about it more. It, that's this other beast that he sees, it performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people, and by the signs that it is allowed to work In the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That's the important part, not the 666. The number of a man, and his number is 666. And that doesn't mean, you know, take out your MasterCard and see if you have 666 somewhere in your your number. If you can think back to our last study, I said we were embarking on an examination of, of the great antagonists of the Church of Jesus Christ in the last days. We're still in this interlude between the seven trumpets and the pouring out of the seven bowls of God's wrath. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. And what's the important thing to remember about the three sevens? They all run right up to the very end. In chapter 12, we examined John's vision of this great power behind all the evil in this world, the serpent of old, 12.9, the great dragon, the devil, Satan, Revelation 12.9. And and so we've been studying his activity all along through much of the book of Revelation, but now John starts to unmask him and his motive, his anger against the people of God. And so when we were going through verse 12, we came to verses 10, 11, and 12, where, where John writes, and he says, And I heard, I heard a loud voice in, in heaven, saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. 12.12, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath 
because he knows his time is short. So Satan knows that he has already been defeated by the birth and death of the male child, Revelation 12, 5. We studied that. He knows salvation has been accomplished. And this infuriates Satan against Christ. And it infuriates Satan against Christ's church because the church worships Christ, obeys Christ, honors Christ, and represents Christ on earth. So the church is the embodiment. The the church is the living, witnessing reminder of Satan's ultimate doom. That's what the church is. But what we're starting to see now, you get into Revelation 13, so this has just been kind of a revisit. The devil doesn't do most of his work openly. He he works through agents and agencies, and, and John introduces us to four agencies through whom the devil works. One, we looked at last week, there's this beast coming out of the sea. That's 13, 1 to 10. And we studied the the power and the role of Antichrist in our last study in this series. If If you can think back, we looked at pretty much great detail at the Apostle John's statements about Antichrist, in 1 John especially, We looked at Daniel chapter 7 and saw that the Antichrist is is sort of another more personal representation of Daniel's description of these coming four empires, a a lion, a bear, a leopard, and finally this beast with ten horns. And when you look at Antichrist, this first beast in Revelation 13, all of those labels are ascribed to him. Exactly the same description. And so we see Antichrist kind of combines all these traits, there'll be a, there'll be a political system, the, the resurrection, it, it, it looked like this was all dead, that's that mortal wound thing, and then comes back to life. It looks like there could never be this kind of a world system under a wicked leader. It doesn't look like that could ever happen again, but it will happen again. The early church, the early church would have read all these descriptions of the beast and thought immediately of Nero. They would have thought of Rome. They would have thought of the way Nero was responsible for the first holocaust of Christian people. And so the idea is, Antichrist, he's going to, there's always been the spirit of Antichrist, many Antichrists, 1 John But there's going to come another specific Antichrist, not just a person, though. A person with a power structure around him, an empire around him. It's political in nature. A Nero-like power. Just when people thought, okay, we're, we're, we're done with that, it will look like that type of power is dead. A mortal wound. But it will be resurrected. It will come back to life under Antichrist in the last days. How's that going to happen? Like when when you look at it now, it seems in some ways unimaginable. And I'm going to come to this again, but I just want to introduce this thought now. This will arise particularly against Christians and the Christian church because, because, and this is starting now, we will be viewed as the intolerant haters and troublers in this world. That's how you're going to be viewed. In other words, the people who cluster around Antichrist won't feel wicked following him in persecuting the church. They will feel righteous in doing it. We will be the ones who will be viewed as intolerant. We're we're against people choosing their own lifestyles. We're against people choosing their own sexual relationships. We're against people choosing their own women's health care and aborting babies. And so this this is going to start to pile up against the church. And if you don't see that starting to happen now, it is. 
Picture it like a concert and this big stage is being built. That's what's happening now. Just getting ready for the concert. Everything's being set in place. You are viewed as the troublemakers. And so, and I don't even know where this, I haven't been following where this issue is now exactly, but, but even in Canada with, with uh, Justin Trudeau and, and the way now there's these student loans and grants, but you can't get it if you're, uh, if you're pro-life. Organizations like churches and camps can't get that government funding. You have to line up with the agenda. And I talk to Christians all the time, and they're like, they're like shocked at this. And I'm thinking, wh wh where did you think this was going? Where do you think this is going? This is just the tip of the iceberg. They're not doing it to be mean. They're doing it because they think it's compassionate. You're the ones who are mean. D do you see where this is going? John sees a second antagonist. We're going to look at tonight this beast rising out of the earth. This is the beast we're going to be studying. And I'll get to it in just a second. I said there were four. The third antagonist won't be considered in detail until Revelation 17. And this power is described with this symbol, symbolic name of Babylon. It's pictured also as a great harlot. This is slightly different. It represents not, not the persecution of the church like the first two beasts, but, but it represents the, the seduction of the church by the pleasures and charms of this world. The fourth antagonist used by the devil is, is one we've already seen, but not really lined up with its proper ally yet, and that is the people of the beast. The people of the earth, they're called. These people become more and more aligned with the beast as they worship the beast, as they bear his mark. They will increasingly come to see Christians as the enemy of all that they value as good and proper and decent in this world. That's why they will actually rejoice. They will rejoice at the persecution and suffering of the church. You see that in, in, in Revelation 11, 7 to 10. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some of the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies, refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who, those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry. They'll exchange presents, party. Because these two prophets have been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. And so we're witnessing just the beginning of that kind of attitude right now as never before. I said earlier, Christians are increasingly viewed as intolerant bigots in this world. We are increasingly painted as the cause of this world's troubles rather than the bearers of good news that this world so desperately needs. John says that's only going to get worse. Here's what's going to happen in the church in my lifetime. Here's what's going to happen in Canada at Cedarview Community Church in my lifetime. If you keep reading things like Romans 1 in this church, in my lifetime, in Canada... That will be banned. And if you continue to do it, your church will lose charitable status. That's what will happen first. It will be an economic punishment. You're going to be around to see that. Decide now whether you're going to keep supporting the Lord's work in this world when you don't get anything back for doing so. Because that's coming soon. It will be a crime to read statements like Romans 1 in an evangelical church in Canada in my lifetime. Where are we going to go with this? Like, are we, are we thinking this through? That's the issue John is thinking about as he sees these visions. All right. Point number one. This second beast, and we're, we're, we're more than halfway through, so relax. 
The most significant feature of this second beast is his religious description. It's almost surprising to see how brief, how brief the description is. We don't get a big picture of this second beast. It, it's in uh, Revelation 13, 11, and, and here's about all that's said. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. Now just think about that. It looks like a lamb, speaks like a dragon. We, we know who the dragon is, very clearly identified in Revelation 12. And so now these, these two images are, are given such a prominent place in the book of Revelation, there's really no doubting John's intent. The beast, he, he comes across like a lamb. People will think he's a Messiah like Jesus. But he speaks like the devil. So in other words, the first beast that we looked at, Antichrist, he represents this political aspect, like, like Daniel's, Daniel's uh, prophetic vision of these four coming kingdoms. And, and the Antichrist will be, will be a, a person, but, but not just a person, a person over a political structure that will gain momentum in the last days. So this second beast is not political. The second beast is, is defined in religious terms. It's, it's picked up in verses like 12 and 13. It exercises all authority of the first beast. It's, it's endorsing, it's, it's uh, empowered by, it's pointing toward Antichrist. Exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence, makes the earth and its inhabitants worship. There, underline, worship. That's what this is about, worship, devotion. And in order to do this, even making fire come down from heaven in front of the people. Uh, uh, miracle works. S special signs that will follow this person. Amazing things. So the role of the second beast is to acquire the worship of the people for the first beast, for the Antichrist. He, he stirs up devotion. He stirs up passion. I said last week, I say it again, it should, not, it should not be hard for any of us to imagine this happening with great ease in this fallen world. I mean, the, the, the contemporary examples, though on a smaller scale, I admit, but they're just so rampant. The media spinners, the fashion producers, they can stir up devotion of the masses like that for nothing. The devotion of the masses can be whipped up to follow the most insane, ridiculous morons. We follow exactly as we're told to follow. Our world is being trained 24-7 not to think for itself. It's being trained 24-7 not to attribute its values to anybody else. It's being trained 24-7 not to judge the way anybody else thinks or acts. That's our world. It's just getting everything ready. So without anyone else even noticing or thinking about what's going on, there's this huge stage being built for the Antichrist. There's a whole generation coming up in the church that won't even see this coming. It'll seem normal. Th this deception, it's made more compelling by, by the supernatural manifestations that this second beast will perform. 13, 14 of Revelation 13, it performs great signs, making fire come down from heaven in front of the people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. So you notice that the signs, that word signs, do you know that's the very same, the exact Greek word that John uses in his gospel to describe the miracles and the signs of Jesus? And so, and so John is saying this, this, 
this religious leader supporting the beast and his system, the Antichrist and his system. He's going he's gonna to work signs. He's allowed to work signs. So the important point here is his ministry, it will seem, it will seem divinely compelling to people. People will think this is God at work. That's why this second beast is, notice, he's repeatedly coined in prophetic terms. He's called the false prophet, 1613, 1920, 2010. So, so people who don't follow this second beast are going to be accused of quenching the spirit or rejecting God's new work or, or any number of things. So accompanying Antichrist and his power structure, whatever political system that's going to be raised again in the last days, there'll be this other element, this, this beast from the land, and, and there'll be a, a concerted effort to keep people from thinking soundly about spiritual things and just to, to give adulation to the Antichrist. Point number two. The second beast is the henchman for the Antichrist against the true people of God. Over and over again, I said this when I introduced this whole series, but it's so long ago, probably, probably n n no one remembers. But the issue in the book of Revelation, increasingly, if you don't get bogged down in, what's that number mean? What's that number mean? If you don't get bogged down in that, Revelation, is, it's, it starts like this, and it, and it funnels down as it reaches the end. And everything is designed, everything is designed to, to separate the world into two groups. That's what's happening. There'll be the followers of Christ and those who don't follow Christ. And aside from your eternal destiny, right now it doesn't seem to make much difference. But it will make an incredible difference. Everything's going to start to matter more. People are going to have to make big decisions to follow Christ, not casual ones. There'll be opposition. There'll be cost. There'll be a price tag in a way that there really isn't right now. So things are going to boil down into two crowds. I get that from Revelation 13 in our text. 15, 16, 17. And it, that's this second beast, was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, both free and slave, everybody, everybody, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless it has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. Let me say something that may be shocking to you. Who the Antichrist is, I don't care. I can show you old issues of uh, the Pentecostal testimony or even the Alliance Witness, all sorts of magazines if you go back and they've got this Pope and Mussolini and all the people that they figured out to be the Antichrist. Figuring out who the Antichrist is or what 666 means, that's not the important point. Seeing the process of separation in the last days is crucially the important point. It's the reason for that strong warning in verse 9. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. All through the book of Revelation. Remember the letters to the seven churches. This is John's way of calling the church not to miss something that she might easily miss if she just hears it carelessly. The false prophet may look like the Messiah. He may say the right things, but he isn't. There's no blessing in empty words. And he will reveal his true colors in two distinct forms of persecution. I want to wrap up with this. First... There'll be physical violence against the church, against the church. The people of the earth, that's John's 
language for those who don't follow Christ. The people of the earth will only see this as ridding the world of the cause of all its misery. They will rejoice for all their talk of love and peace and tolerance. There'll be no tolerance for those that follow Christ. Is this starting to sound a little bit familiar? So on the surface of the things, it's going to look bleak for the church. But, but it's very important for us to remember some of the things we've already seen in John's visions. You need to keep the whole picture in mind or you just get depressed. Satan's victory through these, through these beasts, it, it's only apparent. It's not actual. So 13, 15, and 16, we read that. But you need to read it with the background of, of Revelation 12, 10, and 11 in mind. Where it says, and I heard a loud voice, a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers, that's Satan, has been thrown down who accuses them night and day before God. And they have, they, not, not Jesus, they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of, the tes- of their testimony, for they love not their lives unto death. So there'll be this first form of persecution. There'll be persecution of the church, violent persecution of the church. Secondly, the text says somehow there'll be a huge economic price to pay for following Christ. That's going to be interesting to see. I tried to show you one instance of how I think it will affect the church. But you'll have to figure out how it's going to affect you personally. In 16 and 17, also it, that's this this second beast, false prophet, who, who prompts the worship of Antichrist. Also it causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast, the number of its name. I can remember, I can remember when I was a kid, teachers, teachers, evangelists coming through the church and, and uh, credit cards were just becoming a big deal. And people were convinced this is, this is the beast. And then remember when those, you, whatever you buy at the store, you have those little scanner things? And you just go beep, 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 beep. And they put it in the bag. I can remember, oh, I, guys writing books. And you'd see, that's it. That's the mark of the beast. And, and, and everybody's got all this stuff figured out. One of the false prophets tool to apply pressure to worship the beast will be economic, institutional and personal. So in other words, the approach isn't just to come up to Christians and whack them over the head with a sword. There there will be a system that will be perceived as, as being largely able to solve this world's economic problems. This is a key point to understand. Um, this is why the world will tolerate the persecution of Christians. The world, under the propaganda of the false prophet, don't forget the miracles and the teaching and the signs, it will come to see Christians as messing up their only hope for economic survival. And this kind of economic upheaval will pave the way for the world to embrace the only final solution left. We've seen this kind of thing before. Point number three, the number of the beast. I get asked this all the time. It's the most talked about verse in the whole book of Revelation, and I'm not sure why. 13, 18, this calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Here's my thoughts. I don't know what 666 means. I've never read or spoken to another human being on the planet who knows what 666 means. All I know for sure is 
I don't want to get caught up in any system, economic or otherwise, that rejects the lordship of Jesus in my life. True, like John said, there have been many antichrists. The spirit of antichrist has been in this world for a long time. I still think the important feature is with all of the, um, with all of the power, with all of the might, with all of the supernatural displays, with all of the solutions to the world's problems and the way everybody will worship and fall in line mindlessly into this whole end time system against Christ and his church. I think that the reminder here is it's still, whatever 666 means, we're being told it's the number of a man. God is not in this. It's not a supernatural thing. And it can't win. It can't win. I believe all this is consistent with Paul's exhortation to the church. Uh, to be on the lookout specifically for this end time man of sin, speaking of the Antichrist. I read these last week, I'll wrap up with this. Second Thessalonians two, eight to ten. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing. So you read all these signs, right? You see, the, you see the Antichrist and this whole political system, an empire that looked like it was dead and coming to life in the last days in ways that looked impossible, the, the might, the power of the structure. And then you have this beast, false prophet, who, who, who pulls everyone's attention to the Antichrist. The people worship and people adore and people think this is such a great solution and, and mountains of people just pile up following this system. And the church looks like the enemy. And then you think, where is this all going? And you just read, Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth. This, this whole mountain of end time might. Jesus is going to come. We sing about it all the time. And he's just going to wipe it out. And it says he's going to wipe it out with the breath of his mouth. And bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power, false signs, wonders, with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refused to love the truth and to be saved. There is another number, by the way, that we should care about, another marking that's way more important than the 666. John describes it in the very next verse, Revelation 14, 1. And then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. God will seal and mark and protect. Everything's going to come down to two crowds, and everyone's going to have to make up their mind. And, and, and there's going to be visible consequences either way. These are... These are days for the church to, um, to know the truth of what she believes. These are days for the church to teach people to openly confess Christ before a mocking culture because we need to be trained in that discipline because the peer pressure in the last days is only going to get more intense. And these are days for the church more than ever before to celebrate the unquenchable final victory of Christ when he comes again. And everyone said, let's pray.